Hi there, Allison here with another Cup Franc du Jour. Today's wine is taking us to the Finger Lakes in New York State, and we're looking at the Heron Hill Winery 2020 Ingle Vineyard Cabernet Franc. Heron Hill is among the Finger Lakes' most historic wineries. John and Josephine Ingle planted their first vineyard on Canada Lake back in 1972. In 1977, they established their winery and tasting room on Cuca Lake, just a stone's throw from two other historic wineries, Dr. Constantine Frank and Bully Hill Vineyards. Today, they're farming around 43 acres of vineyards, that's about 17 hectares or so, that are planted with primarily vinifera varieties like Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and of course, Cabernet Franc. Their winemaker, Jordan Harris, who just happens to be Canadian, has been with them since 2020. Uh, and before this, he was making wine in Virginia for the better part of about 15 years or so. As is the case across the Finger Lakes, Cabernet Franc is a very important grape variety for Heron Hill. They're farming around 10 and a half acres of Cabernet Franc vines across their sites on Cuca and Canandaigua Lakes. And in addition to this, they're also sourcing about eight and a half acres of Cabernet Franc from other growers. Today's wine is their Ingle Vineyard Cabernet Franc, and this represents the top expression of Cabernet Franc for Heron Hill. While I have not done a tasting video on a Cabernet Franc from the Finger Lakes in some time, I do continue to taste examples from the region as often as I can. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to taste a number of examples of Cabernet Franc from the Finger Lakes and also other regions from the Eastern Seaboard in the US uh, when I was on Len Thompson's tasting panel for his Cabernet Franc report for his newsletter, Press Fraction. And this wine, the 2020 Ingle Vineyard from Heron Hill, was one of the top expressions of, from the 2020 vintage from the Finger Lakes that we tasted that day. So it's great for me to finally have a chance to retaste this wine and tell you a little bit more about the viticulture and winemaking behind this wine. So the Finger Lakes AVA technically stretches across all 11 Finger Lakes, but the majority of the viticultural activities take place around four of the lakes. From west to east, we have Canandaigua Lake, Cuca Lake, Seneca Lake, and Cayuga Lake. And the vineyard area around Cuca and Seneca Lake uh, actually represents nearly 90% of all the vineyard acreage in the region. In terms of the growing environment, uh, the success of viticulture in the Finger Lakes can be directly attributed to the presence of the Finger Lakes themselves and also the proximity of the region to Lake Ontario to the north, which influences the region's macroclimate. The microclimate of a specific site is heavily influenced by the lakes themselves and not only the distance of that vineyard from Lake Ontario, but its proximity to one of these lakes, as well as elevation and aspect. And that is to say that uh, aspect, uh, that is uh, what side of the lake you are on, does matter here. So uh, if you're on the west side of the lake, generally you'll have east facing slopes. Uh, and if you're on the east side of the lake, you'll see more west facing slopes. And these vineyards with east facing slopes get the benefit of the morning sunshine uh, and they get sunshine earlier in the day. And this is good for reducing disease pressure. And uh, on the east side of Seneca Lake with these west facing slopes, these vineyards will get the benefit of uh, more sunshine hours during the daytime, about an hour and a half more sunshine per day during the growing season, as well as more of the stronger afternoon sunshine. And this is good for ripening longer season varieties. Now, Seneca Lake and Cayuga Lake, these are the largest of the Finger Lakes, and the vineyard area around these two lakes is heavily influenced by the sheer size of these lakes. So these lakes will help to uh, delay warming of the vineyards in the springtime. This will help to uh, delay bud break and thus minimize frost risk. And then the heat that these lakes accumulate during the growing season, this is retained through the fall and this helps to prolong the growing season. Now, the Ingle Vineyard is on Canandaigua Lake and generally speaking, the growing environment around Canandaigua Lake is a little bit cooler because uh, the moderating effect from this lake is less because uh, Canandaigua Lake is smaller and much more shallow. So here the vineyards will often experience bud break a little bit earlier and then during the growing season there'll be a wider diurnal range between daytime and nighttime temperatures and the growing season overall will be slightly truncated. 
Now, I should note that Jordan mentioned that these two blocks of Cabernet Franc, uh, where uh, the Ingle Vineyard is uh, situated, um, these two blocks have actually uh, proven to be excellent sites for the variety and really helped to make what this, uh, what this wine is. So here, these two blocks are on the west side of Canandaigua Lake, and we are about 1,000 meters inland from the shoreline. And we're at an elevation of around 350 or so to 370 meters uh, above sea level on average. And because of this position of uh, these two blocks, the influence from Lake Ontario is actually stronger than that of uh, Canandaigua Lake. And this lake influence, as well as the altitude, means that uh, these uh, vineyard blocks are actually quite windy. And this helps to reduce disease pressure as well as minimize frost risk. In addition to this, these two blocks actually have a slightly more southern exposure, and that's rare on Canandaigua Lake. So these two blocks will get good uh, sun exposure during the growing season, which is great for ripening as well as minimizing the piercings. So in general, these two blocks, uh, it's, a, it's a slightly uh, longer season, albeit cooler season for Cabernet Franc. But this allows Cabernet Franc to achieve good phenolic ripeness while also maintaining slightly lower sugar, so lower uh, potential alcohol. So usually this is around 12.5 to 13%. Now in terms of these blocks specifically, we've got about seven and a half acres of Cabernet Franc vines. One block was planted in 1982, the other block in 2004. And we have a mix of clones here and the vines are trained using uh, the double geo training system. And then in terms of soils, as is the case across the Finger Lakes, what we're dealing with here is glacially derived topsoils that are, range in depth and texture depending on where you are. And these topsoils will either be on top of a limestone or shale bedrock. So here in these two blocks, the soil series is called Howard Sandy Loam, and we've got about 45 to 60 centimeters of this sandy loam topsoil before we hit the shale bedrock. Now in terms of viticulture, uh, this site is naturally uh, low on vigor and low yielding. So usually the site yields around two and a half tons per acre. Now the team will go in and do some judicious judicious leaf pulling during the season, and this is to ensure that the bunches get good sun exposure. Uh, and then as necessary, they may do some cluster thinning uh, before Veraison if, if necessary. Uh, from a winemaking perspective, uh, the fruit for this wine is hand harvested. It is also destemmed into tea bins, and the fruit will undergo a cold soak for about six to 10 days before alcoholic fermentation. And then alcoholic fermentation is with a combination of indigenous and cultured yeast, and the temperature for the fermentation is around 25 degrees Celsius, so a little bit on the cooler side. Uh, and they will go in and do some punch downs uh, twice daily during the act of fermentation. And the total time on skins is about 38 days. The finished wine is a combination of free run wine and pressed wine. And the aging is done in French oak barrels. About 25% or so of that is new. Uh, and the aging will be about 16 months before the wine is then bottled. So let's tuck into this wine. So the nose uh, leans first in this sweet, savory spectrum and definitely leans a little bit more red fruit driven. I'm getting a mix of like this cherry here, there's a touch of crayon raspberry going on, there's a little bit of red plum as well. And as I said, the nose does lean a little bit savory, but the piercings are absolutely just perfect on this wine. Um, there's nothing overtly bell peppery. There's nothing weedy or, or anything like that. The pyrazines for me are coming through like a little bit of an herbal undertone, like sturdy and soft herbs. So like thyme, there's a bit of sage here as well. There is an evergreen element to it. It's not quite cedar. I can't quite put my finger on what that evergreen note is. And there's also a really lovely perfume and fragrance and lift to the overall aromatic profile. And in general, the nose is very pure, lots of clarity here. And I do like the, the floral underpinning on the nose. On the palate, those fruits are confirmed. There's a little smidge more of like a, a wild blueberry note on the palate, which is nice. Pyrazines come through bang on, and I think the fruit and the pyrazines are really nicely in balance. 
There's a nice spice undertone on the palette. I do think some of that is oak spice coming through, like that baking spice clove thing. But there's also a little bit of cinnamon, which sometimes I get as a varietal spice on Cabernet Franc. And then there's also a little bit of a touch of like an espalette pepper thing going on as well. The acidity is juicy. It's lively, bright, almost a little bit crunchy, which is nice. Uh, and then in terms of the tannins, we have very fine, firm tannins. And texturally, they are very reminiscent to almost like a high thread count Egyptian cotton, like you would like in a five star hotel, like the type of Egyptian cotton bed sheets that, that you would find on the beds there. And it, like it, it is very much in that in that texture in terms of the cotton. The overall profile of this wine, it's medium bodied, it's lean, it's uh, elegant, there's a gracefulness and a finesse about the wine. And I think it's really beautifully balanced as well. Yeah, I think that the, um, as I said, the wine is balanced and I think it is really true to the grape. It's true to the place. And there's a lot of integrity here. There's uh, intention, there's some thoughtfulness. And I think for uh, Jordan's first vintage at Heron Hill, this is a really fine effort. And it's a really excellent example of Cabernet Franc from the Finger Lakes. And over the course of the last six months or so, I have tasted uh, probably more Finger Lakes Cabernet Franc uh, than I have in my entire career, um, thanks to the tasting panel that I was on uh, with Len. Uh, and then also I had a chance to uh, teach a masterclass uh, for the Finger Lakes Wine Alliance on Cabernet Franc uh, back in May. So I've tasted a number of examples of the variety uh, from the region. And while I will admit that some examples were very good, some examples left a lot to be desired, I am optimistic uh, with regards to the potential for Cabernet Franc in the Finger Lakes. You know, this is the number one planted red vinifera variety in the region. I can see there is a lot of enthusiasm for this grape uh, amongst, the, amongst the wineries and the winemakers. I think it's just a matter of um, just getting a better understanding of the variety in the vineyards and how to work with it in the cellar in terms of vintage variation. And vintage variation is absolutely a thing. And um, when we were on that tasting panel, you know, the vintages that were on the cooler side, the wines tended to be thin and overly green as if uh, the, the yields weren't managed uh, well uh, in order to balance the fact that it was a cooler growing season. And then in the warmer growing seasons like 2020, it was as if the, the winemaker just did too much in the cellar. Like there was just too much of a heavy hand in terms of extractions and uh, too much new oak. And I think it's just a matter of really feeling the grape in the vineyard and trying to uh, work with it um, the way it deserves to be worked with and, and the way it needs to be worked with in the cellar in order to really get a pure expression of Finger Lakes Cabernet Franc and, and not be afraid of the, the variety strong um, varietal character, which, you know, for me, Cabernet Franc needs a needs a vein of herbaceousness in order for it to be truly Cabernet Franc. And I think you can achieve that without a uh, bell pepper, without something that is uh, overtly uh, weedy. It's just a matter of balancing uh, the, the yields and the canopy and the vineyard and taking care and, and ne touche pas, and being very gentle, uh, gentle in the cellar and kind of uh, less is more, I think, when it comes to Cabernet Franc. But I have to say this Heron Hill Ingle Vineyard 2020 is a, a really an exceptional example of Cabernet Franc. It's certainly one of the, uh, the favorites uh, that I've tasted this year. And if you have a favorite Cabernet Franc from the Finger Lakes, uh, do let me know who the producer is, what the, what the, uh, cuvee is, what the wine is in the comments below. And of course, as always, I will be back again soon with another wine. Cheers.